Well, we've been talking about being blessed, and uh, it's really fun to be with you guys every week. It's it's just such a blessing. I just love it. Um, it's interesting in our culture. It seems like the blessed are those who go along with the party line. Uh, you're blessed if you're part of like the liberal elite in the universities. You're blessed if you. Uh, just kind of are part of the deep state in the political world. You're blessed if you just conform to the, the ways of thinking here in Babylon or Rome or the modern era. But in scripture, uh, Jesus was really, he's just radical. He comes on the scene in a day and age, much like our own, but of course different in its own way, where there was a, a PC culture of the day. And the Jews had their way of doing God, and he came on and totally confronted that. The Romans had their way of doing life, and he confronts the Roman ways and says, well, the blessed are a lot different than you, you think. God's just really different. And uh, if you have a Bible, let's read what he says. He, this is the first sermon recorded for us in the New Testament. It's in Matthew chapter 5. 1 through 6, and you're going to see that uh, Jesus is just really different. He's just a really distinct cat. Verse 1, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Really radically different language here. Uh, one commentator says Matthew was like a river and it opens up into this incredible lake when you get to this sermon because uh, Matthew is clicking along chapter 1, 2, 3, 4 and you get to chapter 5 and it just starts to open up as you start to hear the very words of Jesus. Now we looked at the first four of eight Beatitudes. They have to do more with your relationship with God and the next four are more our relationship with people. Perhaps we'll tackle that next week. But he really deals with what does it mean to be blessed, which I think is an interesting first sermon in general, right? If you're going to come on the planet and give a lot of messages to people, he starts out by saying, let me, this is my first go. Do you guys want to know who God blesses? You want to know who the blessed people are? You want to know like the lens of God and like who he looks at and who he affirms? He just spent a night in prayer. He just chose the 12 disciples. He had just healed a sick man, so he had been doing a, some healings. And then he delivers this, often, as I said before, the best known of sermons, but probably the least understood. And I might even just venture to say maybe the least obeyed. Um, I don't know, maybe that's too difficult. I don't want to be too harsh or anything. But this is like a Christian manifesto. This is his opening, like this is how the kingdom of God is very, very different uh, the people of God were like the people today. They mingled with the culture. And probably the most significant line in the Sermon on the Mount, which is, which is chapter 5, 6, and 7. We're just in the first few verses of 5. But in those three chapters, if you read through it, the big theme is do not be like them. The big theme is do not be like the Romans. Do not be like the Jews. Do not be like the politically correct. Like, you're distinct. <laughs> His sermon is completely countercultural. It's like, you might think, I want to be famous. It's not about that. You might think, I want to be wealthy. It's not about that. You might think, I want to be cool. <laughs> it's not about that. If you want to get your eyes on who J Jesus who the Father really, really likes, it's going to be really, really different. Our love is greater than the world's love. Our ambitions are nobler. Our goals are grander. Do not get caught up in their stuff. 
Do not mingle with the other nations as you have in the Old Testament. You demanded a king because every nation had a king, so you wanted to do it that way. You wanted to worship wood and stone like the other nations instead of the one living true God. You walked in the customs of other nations. You accommodated. Uh, those aren't really the blessed people. The blessed people are quite different. And here again, he gives really eight Beatitudes, eight kind of statements about the blessed people, what one writer calls a golden chain. It's like he links together this golden chain or like eight petals on a flower. They go together to kind of give you a picture of the beautiful blessed people in God's economy. Let's unpack it together. Uh, starting in verse 1 again. He says, now, when he saw the crowds, this is just to remind you of the obvious. Jesus was, he was a rock star. <laughs> Everywhere. I mean, when he was public, there were multitudes. Of course, some plotting to kill him, some totally intrigued, many people just blown away. Uh, this was a guy who was teaching to everyday people, agricultural people. He used metaphors they could understand. These were people who normally didn't attend religious functions, like in a temple. They weren't part of the elite. And this guy was a rock star. He, multitudes follow him. And he went up on a hillside or a mountainside, probably in the vicinity of Capernaum. And uh, this is not a... If you have Moses in your head, you know, and you have kind of uh, Mount Horeb or something in your head, that's not this mountainside. This is not the cold, bleak, barren, howling wilderness winds. Uh, this is what one writer says. It has smiling landscapes with grassy hills and slopes. <laughs> uh, so he goes on a hillside in Capernaum, and he sits down. This is the position of a thoughtful teacher. Uh, this is uh, Matthew's way of letting us know he has now withdrawn from the masses. He's escaped, really, the, the throngs. Uh, you think Lady Di was bogged down by paparazzi. Uh, people just were enamored with Jesus. If he hopped in a boat, everyone hopped in their boats and followed him. So he regularly had to withdraw. And he's withdrawing, and it says he's with his disciples, and his disciples came to him. These are his apprenticed companions. Uh, there are 12 disciples, because in the Old Testament there were 12 patriarchs of 12 nations. And there seems to be some continuity there that God is trying to say, look, I'm doing a new thing, but I'm building on the old. Like the old, we're not throwing it away, we're going to build on that. Because there's something to work with, and they, they came to him. And it says in verse 2, he began to didaskain, which we get our word like didactic from it. We, he began to teach them. Now, three times here, it's already said he, he, he. It's just Matthew in the first few verses here is letting you know the focal point is Jesus. It's him. They're coming to him. It's him who's starting to teach. He's moving from a healing ministry to now a teaching ministry. In other words, he's not just curative. He's like Mr. Preventative Medicine. He wants to teach us how to avoid getting trapped in the ways of the world and getting kind of cuckoo, if you will. One writer says, good words literally put us back together again. They integrate, help, and heal us. Good words. He's starting to teach now with words. And yet wrong words disintegrate us. They make us literally sick. Bad words hurt us. They break us. I see bad words all the time. I, I, I see it on t-shirts, things like no limits. I mean, that's cool maybe for a, a skateboard company or something, but no limits? Who believes that? I mean, who, who can do, who, you have no limits? And doesn't that put people under the pile when they look at their own lives like, well, why can't I do it? Because you have limits. I refed a game last night, and I was, um, right before the game, I went back, we put our jackets in, I'm getting ready to go out, and one of the teams is there, 
And it was funny, they were in a little hallway and we're going to our locker room. So they formed a little thing like, here come the refs, you know. And I'm like, I've never had this before. So I'm running through and I'm like, holy moly, is, it, is there anyone shorter? You know, and there's one guy. I'm like, okay, is he, is he taller? Yeah, he was taller. So I was the shortest guy out there. And um, I don't know where I was going with that. It was, <laughs> Was it, was it, did, it was just a side note. Did it have any fruit? Maybe it'll come back to me. No limits. There you go. I am like, I have limits, right? I'm the smallest guy on the court. And uh, I'd love to think, oh, you can just be as tall as you want, or you can do whatever you want. You just, I mean, it's just crazy. Anyway, so one writer says, this is the basic formula for mental health, by the way. If you kind of really get what Jesus says, you'll be healthy. Uh, mentally health, healthy. What he's going to talk about here as we unpack these Beatitudes is, is not just a subjective state of mind. This is going to be an objective declaration. Jesus isn't saying, you're going to feel really blessed if you're like this. You may feel blessed. But he's like, you will be objectively blessed, of the blessed, by God. This is exactly how God sees people. And if you are, are cluing into that, you'll be of you'll be blessed. You'll be of the blessed. So he's not talking about a subjective state, but let's unpack and see what, what he says. And these aren't new words to us. Uh, they do have a present application, but they also have a future application. If we do these, we'll be blessed. We'll be within the orbit, the lane lines, if you will, of God's will. And you'll be blessed now, but it's also like a foretaste of like the harvest to come. This is like what the kingdom of heaven will be like for all eternity. It's awesome. So let's start in verse 3. He gives uh, the first of the eight Beatitudes. Blessed, in other words, fortunate, are the poor in spirit. That's really an interesting way to start your first sermon. Most people don't think of poor as a blessing. Blessed are the poor in spirit. This means... The impoverished, the dependent, the destitute, the deprived. Luke emphasizes the physical poverty of it. Matthew emphasizes here the spiritual poverty. He's saying blessed are the people who are spiritually poor, spiritually impoverished, in such a way that they basically know their need for God. In other words, they're humble and theirs will be the kingdom of God. In other words, one writer says, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope because with less of you, there's more of God and his rule. The blessed people are those who've tried it all. Uh, sometimes I'll meet people and <laughs> we'll talk about Christianity or something like that. And they're like, ah, oh, I'm not into that. And I'm like, well, what are you into? You know, I'm, you know, and I, yeah, and yeah, you, mm-hmm, and you, mm-hmm, Yeah. And you go to crazy places and do crazy things. And, you know, I'm, you know, that's one thing when you're 21. I'm like, they're 31, 41, 51. Need I go on? And I'm like, well, how's that working for you? <laughs> how's that working for you? You're on your fourth marriage. What do you think? And what have you learned? Right? Your health is waning. You know, you've changed businesses. And, you know, how's that working? Because... You're apparently not at the end of your rope yet. You still keep trying ways to fill your stuff, you know. Yeah, but you, you ought to try this and that drug and this, that. and Like, how's that working for you? I mean, when you get to the end of all your pleasure seeking and you've done enough drinking and drug, let me know how it is. Let me, I'd love to hear if, if it works for you. I've never met anyone who's like, it's unbelievable, transform my life. I guess Jesus is saying, if you need to go try it all, you can. But you know who the blessed people are? They're done with that. Blessed are people who are conscious of their misery, their wants, their limits, their mortality, as I shared refing, their finitude, their smallness, their helplessness, their brokenness, their neediness, their small... This is so radical. Uh, the way to rise in the kingdom, as, as Spurgeon used to say, is to sink 
into yourself. John MacArthur says, the door into his kingdom is low and no one who stands tall will ever go through it. We cannot be filled until we're empty. We cannot be made worthy until we recognize our unworthiness, until we recognize that we can't live, until we admit that we're dead. Um, so there's something in here about blessed are the poor in spirit. Basically, blessed are people who know they aren't going to make it work themselves. That they need God. That they were created by a creator who is a key part of their life. And those people will be blessed because they'll quit spending time trying to like pull it all together and act like they're, they're perfect. He says, uh, number two... Blessed are those who mourn. I don't love mourning. I, I really don't love grieving, personally. But they're blessed because they'll be comforted. Blessed are those who are in touch with sorrow and sadness because they will be encouraged, comforted, consoled, and encouraged, meaning they'll have more courage because it'll be given to them. Because they're aware of their need. The message says you're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. And only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. I don't know. This is kind of radical, I think. He's not talking about moping or living long-faced or drooping the head or a sour smirk or blessed are those who never smile. He's not saying something like that. But he's saying, blessed are those who are tracking that we live in a fallen world, and it's terrible. It's terrible here. As much as we want to emphasize, there's some beautiful things here. And the amazing thing is we can make a pretty good run of it with God on our side in a broken world. But there is disease here, and there's decay, and it's unfair. And cruel things happen. And people can be so obtuse. And so you can get betrayed. And you can get hurt. Like it's blessed are those who are tracking. We're not in happy land. You're going to be blessed if you realize this isn't Pleasantville. Because that will help you. You'll be of the blessed because you're tracking. I'm created for another world. My true citizenship is not here. It's with the kingdom for all eternity. And you won't be thrown off your horse every time you'd go, who would do that? I can't even believe that. You can't, why can't you believe that? <laughs> Where do you think you're living? This isn't Oz. Um, and then even when you arrive at your Oz, you always find out, right? Oh my goodness, the wizard's like a crackpot, you know, behind the curtain. <laughs> it's like, uh, we thought the Emerald City would deliver something amazing, and it never pans out. <laughs> Okay, Robert Browning Hamilton said, I walked a mile with pleasure. She chatted all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. But I walked a mile with sorrow, and never a word said she. But oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. So there is something really radically countercultural when Jesus says, You're blessed when you're tracking with sorrow. Number three, he says, blessed are the meek, means gentle or lowly or humble, for they will inherit the earth. Of course, meekness is not weakness. It's not spineless. It's not gutless. It's not weak or effeminate or impotent or anything like that. John Stott, one of my favorite mentors I studied under in London back in 83, said, meekness is essentially a true view of oneself. Blessed are those who have like a true view of themselves, expressing itself in attitude and conduct with respect to others. The man who's truly meek is the one who's truly amazed that God and man can think of him as well as they do and treat him as well as they do. Oftentimes, you know, people will share with me about their marital difficulties and they're like, it just shouldn't be this way. I'm like... No one should be married to a man who does this or a woman who does that. Like, it, should be, it shouldn't be this hard. It should be much easier. I'm like, why? 
Like, where are you coming from? I'm amazed anyone stays married, aren't you? I, it's so hard to live with the not you. <laughs> it's just so hard. It's like, if you, why is she doing it that way? Like, I would never do it that way. I would never think that way. I don't look at life that way. It's like, if you could just be a mini me, like if you would be a mirror, a reflection, a narcissistic image, it would be so much easier. But you're so not me, and that's so crazy making. And it's like every cell of my wife's body is different than me. Every single cell, like our brains don't work the same. My corpus callosum is damaged. I'm more compartmental. She's more whole. You know, it's like, and the people are like it shouldn't be this hard. You know, just I, I just can't believe it. After all these years, I mean, I've I've been with him three years. <laughs> I'm like, wow, he really sweated it out. <laughs> it's like, I've been married three decades. I haven't figured it out at all. I'm more confused today than when I first got married. I'm like, I thought I had it for a while there, but no. So, sheesh. Blessed are the meek. Meek, they have a, a, a true view of themselves, and that is that they're, they're not entitled to anything. Talk about slogan t-shirts and things in commercials. You deserve a break today. I don't deserve anything but hell. And when you start there, when you start there, it's like, it's amazing. People are as kind to me as they are. It's amazing that our marriage and our family, like we're navigating life as well as it is happening. And it's amazing there's other crazy people on the planet who want to journey with us. Thank you. Like, Lord, we don't deserve this. We know who we are. We know if we were the only person on the planet, Christ would still have to come and die for us. Is that crazy or what? If you're the only person here, it's like, nope, I have to send my son. He's going to have to be like killed because of you. It's like, wow, sobering. Blessed are the meek, and I think it's so radical, they will inherit the earth. Probably better translated, they'll inherit the whole earth as God promised. In other words, when the consummation of time is over, not heaven. If I died today, I'd go to heaven just in spirit. You can put my little body in a casket for a time until the, the resurrection of Christ. Then my body will be glorified and reconnected with my spirit. And ultimately, God will usher in the, the eternal state, which will be a new heaven and a new earth on this planet with a new glorified body. And the people who are going to inherit that earth, that kingdom, the people who are going to live here for all eternity as it's supposed to be without all the craziness and not the thorns and the thistles, are the meek. The people who know they're not, the people who don't strut, they're not cocky. People who are, the, the grateful people. What a great week for that, right? And Thanksgiving. The people were like, wow, blessed beyond measure. And finally, let's just do one more. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. These are people who have an appetite, a craving, a yearning for righteousness because they will be filled. Now, this is an important one because this is not people who have a hunger and a craving and a thirst to make themselves righteous. We have oodles of those in the church, I'm told. <laughs> I've experienced. This is not people who are like, I'm going to be so good. You just, I'm just going to clean up my tongue and not drink and I'm going to be so holy and so righteous and I'll be able to look down on other people and condescend because I will have worked so hard to pull it all together. But it's amazing how yucky these people are. I don't even want to be contaminated by them, but bless their hearts, I'm going to pray for them because I'm such a goody-goody. This is not blessed are the people who hunger and thirst for self-righteousness. This is people who realize even my best works are but filthy rags before God. <laughs> 
These are people like, even if I try really, really, really hard to have quiet times and like walk with God, I'm still like a wretch. I don't know why I gave that piece of choreography to that person on the freeway when they cut me off. I, I have no idea what happened. It just came out of me. I have no idea where those words came from. And I may disown them. I may say, I'm sorry, that, was, that totally wasn't me. Oh, really? Who was it? <laughs> Who, who was it, O.J. Simpson? Remember the real me. <laughs> yeah, we remember. Um, this is people who hunger and thirst for God's righteousness, and they'll be filled by God because they know there's no way. Look, you can give me, I, I can have the best year possible. It's not, I'm, I can't pull it off. It's just not in me. I'm broken and fallen. That's why we're filled with the Spirit because we need God to work through us, the vine and the branch. That's why we need our minds transformed, because we're automatically going to get conformed to this world. Not like, use my best mind. No, I need a transformed mind. This is why we have to depend on Christ. Give us this day our daily bread, because we can't pull it off ourselves. And if we do, we're going to become rigid and stiff and very religious. And you've been around these people, right? They always know that we're just doing it for God and... We just have high standards, and oh yeah, they're high. And, and their, their view of themselves is very high too. The people who actually be satisfied, the people who actually be filled, are the people who hunger and thirst for God's righteousness. They, they just hunger for God. Isaiah 64, all our righteousness are as po polluted garments. Jeremiah 2, for though you wash yourselves with lye and use abundant soap, the stain of your guilt is still before you, says the Lord Jehovah. These are people who realize, <laughs> I can give it a good go, and I certainly will, will do that, but apart from Christ, I can do nothing, really. Nothing that's really redeemable. I could love my wife the best I could. It would never be enough. I, I need Christ's love through me. It's like, Lord, could you just love her how she really, <laughs> you know, w would really be helpful for her. But it, I, I, I'm like, I cap out. I need your love. And your love is patient. Macrothumia is and kind and not jealous and not in. You're like, th that's not how we're made. We're not wired that way. But those are fruits of the spirit, love and joy and peace and patience. Those are fruits of me connect, you working through me. Thank you. Lord. So, in conclusion for today, it's Jesus gives his first sermon, and I think, again, they're common words. It's not like we've never heard this stuff, but I think it's just so radical. <laughs> Don't be like them. Don't be like your neighbors and your friends and everyone else today. Just that's not who we are. We're distinct. We're different. We're countercultural. It's, it's just a different ballgame. First sermon, I'm shooting right out of the chute. If you want to be like of God's blessed people, it's a different ball game. Blessed are the poor in spirit. He has nothing against wealth. Nicodemus was wealthy. Joseph of Arimathea was wealthy. Uh, others were wealthy f financially, but he's like, but they have a poverty about who they are, and they know that they need God. Blessed are those who mourn. They'll be comforted. He's not opposed to you having a, a good day or being happy or, you know, good, having a good laugh. But you're going to be blessed if you don't act so crazy manic like people in our culture. Like, just think happy thoughts. I, I need Dale Carnegie like I need a hole in my head. I mean, I don't need to, like, pump... Um, craziness like just be happy or just think good thoughts or you know this crazy secret stuff you know the like you the energy you put out it'll bring great energy back i have great energy and people do mean stuff sometimes i'm like what <laughs> what oh yeah people are starving in in africa because they're not giving off good vibes i don't think so we have to mourn because it's hard here we know that but we also see you comfort us because you tell us you're pre preparing a place. This isn't the f our final home. And we're not here that long. Amen? We're not here that long. So, Lord, 
we mourn and we thank you for your comfort that you get us through it. Blessed are the meek, they'll inherit the earth. We don't have to be pompous or proud or act like we have it together. In fact, we can get off the perfectionistic track right now. We're not going to make it. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst not to be really good Christians. We have enough of those. We really do. I don't want to be like any of them. I, I hate to, I just hate to say, it just sounds wrong, but I want to hunger and thirst for God's righteousness with a community of people who understand we don't have it together. They know their pastor doesn't have it together. I mean, Joel has it together, but, <laughs> but yes, he does, right? But there's always one of those quirky mutants among the group that you go, how does he do it? But for the rest of us, we hunger and thirst together because we know we're knuckleheads. And when we do knucklehead stuff, we apologize and go, you know what? I was totally impatient. I'm so sorry. I said I'd call you and I didn't. And we just own it and we fall on the sword and we stay humble and like, thank you for loving me in spite of me because we're hungering and thirsting for God's righteousness, which is imputed to us. It's substituted for us. He's exchanged it for us. Thank you. We would never stand before God righteous on our own merits. And he's the one who fills us. He's the one who, who satisfies us in our deepest place. So as you apply uh, this to yourself, ask yourself, you know, am I one of the blessed? I, I'm, I'm certainly one of the blessed if I'm, I'm humble and one of the blessed if I'm willing to mourn and embrace reality. I'm one of the blessed if I'm meek, don't have to defend myself, don't have to act like I have it together. I'm blessed if I hunger and thirst for God's righteousness and just come clean and let people know I, I'm not righteous. I wanted to say I, I'm not that righteous, but I, I should just come clean, right? I'm, I'm not righteous, really. There's no, there's no part of me. There's not a cell that has escaped the fall. Like every part of me has been tainted with sin. That's what we call the doctrine of total depravity. Again, not for Joel, but for the rest of us, <laughs> total. <laughs> like, not even like Achilles, where like a part of it, you know, got, no, we need God. So, there you have it this morning. You want to debrief? We have a little teach and talk, a uh, few minutes. Uh, what did you learn? What stood out? Uh, what did God say to you? These aren't new words to you, but uh, maybe something fresh today. I don't think I could live with a new 